Hello, everybody. I'm Sheila Donnelly. Really pleased to be back with you for another ASAP vlog. These are great resources for you and other assistants, and I'm delighted to see you here taking advantage of it. I'm going to pop into my presentation here because I'd like to let you know we are focusing indeed on public speaking, finding your voice. And this is something that can be challenging for many people. Now, this time together, I think, can be impactful for you, not only in your career, also personally. And when you think about what does this person know about the career, what does she know about public speaking? Well, as you can see from the screen, and some of us have worked together before, as you can see here, my career goes back to the days, not only of IBM typewriters, the IBM Selectric carbon paper, and golf balls, which we use to get fancy fonts on our, on our projects, it extends from that almost three decades to 2018 when I left my career after spending a decade supporting a board of directors. I worked with senior executives in both the private, the public sector, and I started my career all over again after kids. I did wind it up working with the board, and in that role, I had the support of a half-time assistant myself, so I do understand the career. And now, since then, I've been writing, speaking, and training professionally as my career. So I understand your career, and as you'll soon see, I also have a bit of experience with public speaking. It's worth taking a second, though, to think, what are we talking about when we think of public speaking? You know, it can mean different things to different people, and there are different circumstances in which we use public speaking skills. One of the first things that may come to mind for you is standing in front of an audience whether you have an iPad, some notes, a lectern blocking you, maybe feeling, helping you feel safe from your audience, they aren't the enemy. Those are some typical examples and circumstances in which we use our public speaking skills. And there are more, can you think of some? Think of conversations you need to have with your principal, also known as your boss. It's a really good skill for an assistant to be able to speak truth to power or simply communicate effectively. And when we polish, when we practice our public speaking skills, we don't need to wait until we're in front of a room, a group or a group of peers or other stakeholders to use those public speaking skills. You can use them for effective one-on-one -on -one communications with your principal. You may use them in negotiating, whether it's a with a colleague, someone internally, externally. These can be really useful when you're preparing and using your public speaking skills when you want to negotiate certain time off, uh, perhaps a hybrid working relationship, compensation when it comes to performance review time, or simply sorting out who will have time off when. We can also use these public meeting, public meeting, public speaking skills when we're in meetings, can't we? We may be asked to give an opinion or we may choose to be visible, to be demonstrating our engagement and our support of the organization. And when we do that, we can tap into skills that help us to communicate really effectively. What about some other circumstances in which you might want to tap into public speaking skills? Well, when I think of these, I think of interviews. And all of us have been to interviews, I'm sure, at one point or another in our career. And there are probably more interviews ahead of us. No matter how stable and secure our current environment is, there are situations where other people are assessing us and our capabilities. Now, public speaking is something that challenged one assistant I know really severely when it came to her, her interviews. Dawn is a person who is an assistant. This was when I was working in higher education. I was executive assistant to the dean, and I was responsible for supervising, as well as all the other work, for supervising a team of six different assistants, different job titles, classifications, on different campuses and in different offices. So every once in a while, we received a word of budget, budget capacity so that we could uh, make a position full-time or permanent. And that was the case when this one assistant, whom I'll call Dawn, had been working with us for a little while. Now, Dawn was a good assistant. People liked her. She understood what we were doing. She, she interacted really well with people. And yet Dawn had been with that organization longer than I had at that point in time. 
and always as an auxiliary, on-call, or temporary assistant, whatever the terms you use, you, you might be familiar with this. Someone who the organization likes, they keep bringing into assignments, and yet she had not landed a permanent full-time job that came with all the benefits, the, the vacation time, the sick leave, the benefits that as a single mom were really important to her. And so when in one particular opening came up, it was in fact regularizing or making the job that Dawn did permanent, full-time with all the benefits, all the package that, that the rest of us in the office already had. And so Dawn was preparing to apply for this. And as the person responsible for supervising her and for performance management, <coughs> we knew that Dawn had not done well on past interviews, not just in our faculty in our area. She came to me one day and said, I'm scared to death of this interview. I know I'm going to bomb it. Now, how's that for going into something with a certain attitude? And yet the fact was at the rate she had been going, Dawn was right. She was not comfortable with public speaking, no matter how great she was one-on-one -on -one, in groups with her colleagues, with, with other people more senior in the organization. When it came to interview situations, she made a bunch of mistakes and they stemmed from being uncomfortable with public speaking. They also stemmed from not really understanding how to prepare for a job interview. That's an entirely different course I present. However, these are some of the things that kept happening when Dawn would come to an interview. She was more than capable. While this was a competition and people were being objective, not subjective, she stood a really good chance on paper. However, Dawn wasn't comfortable with public speaking. She wasn't comfortable with going in front of even just three or four colleagues, people she knew, people who liked her. What she also did was she made assumptions about what the panel could and couldn't do. We had to assign points on the basis of how she responded to questions, how she marketed herself, how she, how she, how she presented herself to us and what she said. And the key is she did not articulate effectively at all what she would bring to the role. This is in part because she was nervous about public speaking. She didn't consider the potential questions that might be asked. So when questions were asked, we heard a lot of, um, or like, you know, and it was also clear that Dawn had not practiced. Now, I'm glad to tell you that with some hard work, and some of the steps that I'm going to outline today, Dawn did get the job that next application, that full-time permanent position. And that made a huge difference in her life. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that listening to me today and taking these ideas into account will get you a new job. That would be foolish. I am here to promise that if you take these ideas and if you work them consistently, routinely, if you apply yourself, you can make a big difference in your comfort and success with public speaking. Are you ready? Now, it's important to know that many people are uncomfortable with public speaking. And when I think of Dawn in the interview room and as she was practicing, these could all be indicators of what Dawn was going through. You feel your heart going quicker if you're uncomfortable with public speaking. You might need a hanky and, and just that little tightness of the neck and all sorts of other aspects of the body come into play when we are afraid of public speaking. I hope, I hope that you've never felt the urge to do this <laughs> and uh, in, when it came to being asked to, put, to speak. And yet I do know that that is the case for some people. There's shortness of breath, there's dizziness. Now you may be here because you have none of these issues or challenges and you want to polish your public speaking skills. So good on you. And if you are someone who does experience some of these challenges when you're asked to present to a group or step before a crowd, if you have that urge to get the heck away, get out of Dodge, this will help you. So all of those things I just described go back to our ancestors thousands and thousands of years ago, the fight or flight syndrome, the dizziness, the shortness of breath, the anxiety, the heart beating away, the palpitations might be hyperventilating. Those have been found to be traced to the days when we had to worry about much more significant issues than an interview panel. And if you are someone who's less than comfortable with the idea of public speaking, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, in a group setting, in an interview, 
it may help to know that you're not alone. This is not specific to assistants. Some assistants are highly skilled public speakers. You may be one of them here saying, what other tips can, that can I get? It may help to know that even people at the top of the org chart and all across it can also have challenges with public speaking. The other part to know is that anyone, whatever your job level, whatever your job title, however new, green, or experienced you are in the career, we can always take steps to improve. Now, what am I showing you here? I'm trying to give you an indication of research which shows us, and, and there's varying, there are varying reports and research studies that have slightly different findings. However, some things that are pretty frequently cited are that there is only one person in 10 who actually loves, and I mean enjoys, public speaking. At the other end of the spectrum, down there in the red, there's usually one person in 10 who is seriously terrified of public speaking. And, and it's a gauntlet to even think of standing or sitting in front of a crowd and giving a presentation. We want to have empathy for those people at that end of the, of the, of the situation. In the middle, statistics suggest that up to 75% of people have a fear of or are uncomfortable with public speaking. And then there's some people who are in the middle who do a good job and, and perhaps don't always give themselves enough credit for how effective they are. So with our time today, I do believe that if you apply these principles, if you're out on the fringes in terms of, I'm really, really uncomfortable with this, Sheila, or I don't like being in the spotlight, Sheila, I hope that if you think about these ideas, these principles we're going to cover, you might find yourself moving a little closer to that sweet spot in the center where you enjoy it. You may never love public speaking. However, as you build skills, and that's what it is, it's all skills. As you build skills, work on them, polish them, and take advantage of opportunities to do a bit of public speaking, I do believe you can move closer, if not right into that circle where you enjoy it, I do believe you can get closer to it and be effective with it. So earlier on, I said, you're probably wondering what this person knows about the assistant career, what they know about public speaking. Well, this is a picture near the end of my grade nine year. I was 14, uh, 14, 15 years old then. And this is some of the loot I had earned, and earned is the right word, through public speaking competitions. When I was a teenager, I was engaged in drama, voice lessons. I had my own voice teacher, and she would be reminding me right now to stand tall, and I can hear Audrey Mellors in my ears. And so I did enter a lot of competitions, and I won or came in very close to winning almost everything I entered. Am I bragging? No. I'm telling you this because it is something you can achieve. You may not want trophies. You may simply want to be comfortable with public speaking. And what I'd like you to know is that like anything else, it is a skill. You can achieve comfort or more comfort and confidence in public speaking if you apply yourself and practice. So you ready to do that? Is this how some people you know or you yourself feel when it comes to being invited to chair a meeting, to lead a project, to, to give a report and update? What if you're in a meeting with a bunch of colleagues and you're there recording the meeting and all of a sudden your executive says, hey, can you give us an update on how such and such is going? Do you dread being asked such questions or those opportunities? Are you uncomfortable? If you are, all these things we've been talking about have a term. And I don't want to dwell on the term. It's glossophobia. It's a very fancy way of saying a fear of public speaking. So we know there's a name for it. What we want to do instead of focusing on the issue of the fear is figuring out how to master it, how to master discomfort or how to master fear of public speaking. And use that voice. You have experience. You have insights and perspectives. And they're worth hearing when they're informed, when you prepare, and when you deliver a presentation, drawing on skills which you practice. You may have heard of the painter Georgia O'Keeffe. This is not her artwork, this is some of my photography because I like to respect copyrights. Georgia O'Keeffe was a widely recognized painter. She still is to this day. She lived to the age of 98 years old, she was born in the 1800s. She painted New York skyscrapers when they were emerging. 
and she also painted, she's very famous for her floral paintings. Look at what this pioneer, this famous woman, who's recognized all over the world, said about fear. So I put it to you, here we are in the 21st century. Don't let fear keep you from doing a single thing you want to do, including public speaking. Now, we've looked at why we might be needing public speaking skills. Let's think for a minute and check in and see if any of these apply to you. Why do we hesitate to public speak, to speak publicly? Well, I'm going to paraphrase and twist Elizabeth Barrett Browning's words here. So let's take a look at why do I fear thee or dislike or avoid thee? Because I know some assistants who are terrific, who have a lot to say, who can add value to conversations, who avoid taking opportunities to do public speaking. So let's count some of those ways. I don't know about you, uh, we haven't been this year or, or since the pandemic, and yet we have a terrific exhibition. Of, of, it's not a fall fair, it's an end of summer fair called the PNE, the Pacific National Exhibition. And when I think of public speaking, I think about some of the rides and activities you can do at the fair, and think about this in your community. Now, I don't know about you, but just, just as I enjoy public speaking, I love roller coasters. I love this roller coaster in particular. It's old, it's wooden, you can hear everything clacking as you go by, and I find it exhilarating. I know that just like public speaking, though, some people find it terrifying. So why do we avoid public speaking? There's one reason. Again, we might be concerned about how we would sound. We might think, my voice doesn't sound good enough, or I might sound unintelligent, or I might sound foolish. Mm -hmm. We'll feel vulnerable. We all feel vulnerable. If you care about your audience when you are public speaking, you are making yourself vulnerable. That's the fact of life. Another reason we might be concerned about losing control. You might be one of these people I know and admire for so many reasons. Yet these people prefer to be one of the crowd, keeping a low profile. They don't want the spotlight shining on them, and that may describe you. You might be concerned or fear afraid of failing. Now we hope that things that such as this ride never, never fail, and this one didn't. Yet when we think about failure, part of the fear of failure comes to down to failing not only personally and knowing that we failed, also failing in front of other people our colleagues, our friends, our peers. And I get this, we can feel intimidated, whether we're speaking in front of people we're comfortable with or, or people we want to particularly impress or there's a, a lot at stake with a discussion. So again, think about mastering any fears or discomfort you have. And we can do this by flipping, flipping our perspective. So we just looked at a bunch of pictures of a dad and his son and some other people at the PNE. And you may have looked at it and thought, oh, I'd love to do that. No, I couldn't do all of those rides myself. The roller coaster, yes, but dangling, <laughs> dangling above crowds, no. However, when we take those ideas and we put that into public speaking, into our approach to public speaking, let's look at things a little differently, those same concepts. We said public speaking can be terrifying, or, or I said it can. You may also agree. Just as it can be terrifying, if we approach it and practice, public speaking can be exhilarating. I get to speak with assistants in different countries, working with you here right now and in person, and there is a really good feeling when you work with people, when you speak with people, when you're able to communicate effectively what you want and, and you see people's eyes light up or people's uh, insights being, being reconsidered. Uh, when, you, when you have an impact on someone, it's terrific. We can also stretch those boundaries of our comfort zone. And when we are open to public speaking and when we practice, it takes work. When we practice, we can help people see our capabilities, the extent of what we can do and how we might impact our employer, our organization, and why we might deserve a promotion or a salary increase or that professional development we want. We can also inspire other people. There are benefits. You know, I get it. I know a lot of people who want to blend in with the crowd, yet there are benefits you might be missing out on. And so you might want to reconsider 
maybe I should step out from the crowd from time to time because it can feel really good to move out from those comfort zones. And how do we do all this? You know, if, if you are someone who thinks this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, what if, what if? Okay, own those thoughts. Don't dwell on them, own them and think, how can I plan? How can I prepare? And then I will practice to do my best to ensure those things don't go wrong. Envision a best case scenario of, in terms of your public speaking. And you know what's really important is that we need to own and acknowledge we're going to make mistakes. The most experienced speakers will make mistakes. When we get comfortable, when we get confident with public speaking, one of the things that we can do is recognize we're going to make mistakes. We want to avoid dwelling on them or apologizing while we're speaking. What we want to do is move forward, make sure we're clear. If we need to clarify something, do so without apologizing all over your feet and move forward. The other thing about mistakes is, you know what? Sometimes people don't even realize we've made them. They might be shining out of our, our brain telling us, ah, you messed up, you messed up. And yet other people may not even realize we missed something we intended to say or we said it a little differently than we practiced. So I think to put to you a couple of people's thoughts about public speaking. How about this one? It was famously or infamously said by a politician who was not too skilled at the art of public speaking. Now, what about this? Have you ever been in an audience and heard someone present and thought, I could do that? Good. If you can, do it. Or have you also watched someone speak and just been either mesmerized or engaged or inspired and thought, how did they do that so easily? Well, the trick is, it takes work. And that's what Mark Twain had to say. It's not something, even the most skilled people don't just pop up and make a wonderful speech without the benefit of experience, practice, and skills. Because, as you see here, even the best speakers work at it. And you know what? It's not even. It's the best speakers, the most gifted speakers are often that way because they routinely practice what they're doing. Not just when you're performing or standing in front of an audience or a meeting, it's because in the background, in the quiet moments, these people take time, invest time in their public speaking skills. And I suggest to you, it does not determine, uh, your, your success in speaking isn't determined by whether you're an introvert, an extrovert, or someone with qualities of both, equal qualities of both, that's an ambivert, someone who likes, intro, has introversion qualities and is also happy putting themselves out there. You can master this, just like George O'Keefe, you can master fears and discomfort when you invest time and energy in yourself by working at it. So some other thoughts on speaking in front of other people. What do you think of this one? Marion Robert Morrison, also known as the Duke, John Wayne. Now, when he's saying talk low, we're not speaking about mumble so no one can hear you. What he's referring there to is modulation of voice. Quite often, when someone is uncomfortable or uncertain, their voice will take a swing ride up at the end of a sentence. And that is what John Wayne was referring to. Modulate your voice. Be present and sounding in control of what you're saying. What about this? Some of you may be in this group right now. And what about the other half? This is Robert Frost, and I think that's an effective saying. You know, you may be, if you are someone who is less than thrilled with the notion of public speaking, you may see people do public speaking in meetings, in one-on-ones, in front of an audience or a large group of colleagues. You may think, oh, I admire them. And there may be others who you watch who say, would they please sit down? We don't want to be in either of those camps, do we? Someone who has something valuable to contribute but not comfortable saying it, or people who just babble on and on with no purpose and without adding value. So what I suggest to you is that we can prepare to speak with purpose because we want what we say to be relevant, meaningful, and we base that on knowledge. So that means we're doing some homework, doesn't it? We need to be informed. And sans foi. 
Is this what you're saying at your end? Sans foi is a fancy word for explaining that we are free from agitation. We're not excited. Not that we're unexcited, it's not a negative thing. It's just that there's no disturbance. We're not perspiring. We don't have those tense muscles, the fluttering heart. It means we're free from all that. It means we have coolness in trying circumstances. And actually, I do believe a lot of assistants exercise, exercise or demonstrate sans foi in a lot of aspects of the career. Calmness in danger or difficulty. So if you think of public speaking as going on that roller coaster or one of those rides that look terrifying to you, that's what we're aiming for, sans foi, calmness in danger, or if public speaking is difficult for you, in difficulty. We are going to look now and some ideas, some steps I have for you to speak with some thought. And I'm breaking these down into 11 steps when you want to prepare yourself to speak. And you can approach this, take this approach so that you use it, whether it's for a uh, presentation, a formal presentation, a project update, perhaps the office is moving and you're, you're the point person with what's going on, or you're going on to a new system, Forget about the office moving. Perhaps you're looking, you're part of the planning for uh, hybrid relationships, hybrid reporting relationships, and who will be back where, when, and you've been asked to give an update on it. You can use these steps to prepare. Think about it in terms of standing in front of an audience and perhaps stepping out from that lectern, not using it as a barrier or a defense mechanism. And then after these 11 steps, I have nine for you that help you when you're actually stepping out and stepping forward to speak. Are you ready? So when we are preparing to speak, think of a topic that you might want to present on. The first thing is we want to know our audience. What do they need? What do they want? What do they expect of us? When I started, started preparing for this vlog today, I thought, all right, I know there are assistants with different degrees of comfort with public speaking. I never want to pander to people. So I know that while some people may be uncomfortable, petrified with public speaking. There are others here who are good at it already and simply polishing those skills. So we want to know what our audience already knows about our topic, what they need to know, and what they, why they're there listening to us. We can do this by reading and also talking with actual people who will be in our audience. We want to know our topic. Remember Robert Frost, half the people speaking and they have nothing to say. We need to be sure that we have invested effort and care in knowing what we're speaking about. So from there, you may want to draft your remarks and you can do that on pen and paper. You may do a, a mind map idea where you're putting ideas all over a piece of paper and then connecting them together and then put them into a document and then from there work on if you're using PowerPoint or some other product you may want to then put them into that format. The next step is to think, is there something I can tell this group or this person that makes what I want to communicate with them relatable, engaging, interesting? I don't want to look at a bunch of bullet points. So not only do we think about the design, and that's a different topic as well, the key though is can we come up with some story, something that's relevant and authentic? in my books, it needs to be authentic, that can help make the presentation engaging as well as relatable to people. The next step is to practice. And you can see, I'm saying practice before a plant, a pet, a mirror, and then a person. Remember Dawn, I told you about Dawn at the outset today? Some of the pieces of advice I gave to Dawn included going home. After she'd done the, the, the homework she needed to do in terms of how to conduct a job interview, then she needed to practice how she could communicate information, why she was the right person for the role. And so what I didn't tell you before, I told you Dawn was a mom. She has, she has, she still does have, she has three kids. At that point, their ages ranged from 13 to I think 17. And so Dawn went home, didn't have a big place. They had one bathroom. And I had said to Dawn, you know, if you're not comfortable speaking in front of a mirror, how can you expect to be comfortable speaking in front of the dean, me, other people who will be on the interview committee, on the panel. So I said to her, go home, lock yourself in your bedroom or your bathroom and practice saying answers you might give to interview questions to a mirror. 
get comfortable saying it with yourself to yourself before anyone else. And if that doesn't work, if that seems too daunting at first, go in front of your plants, name your plants after people you might be speaking with, pretend you're speaking to them, or pet, pets are really good audiences. And so Dawn did do this. She went straight to the mirror, give her credit. She didn't have a pet, and the plants were where the kids would be, home from school when she got home from work. So she wasn't going to practice in front of her kids. She went, locked herself in her bathroom. And she did tell me that uh, for the first few days, her kids would be knocking on the door, Mom, are you all right? She had told them what she was doing, but she kept breaking down into giggles. She felt silly talking with herself in the mirror, or she was critical of herself and she'd say self-deprecating things. Her kids got used to their mom talking to herself in the bathroom, and that is what helped her in the actual interview. Now, we have all sorts of ways of recording ourselves, don't we? You could use, uh, not, not to endorse any particular brand, you could use Otter. You could use all sorts of technology, AI we have, to record yourself and then play it back, whether you're listening strictly to your audio, which might be a good first step, because we want to think about how we sound, the pace of our words, our voice modulation, whether we use pauses or silence, and if we use them effectively, and whether we are saying something interesting and informative. So that's one thing. The other thing we could do is also, if you have Zoom, which you will, I'm sure, have Zoom or Teams, you could practice, set up a meeting and record yourself and look back to see how you sound. And because we are doing so many of our presentations over screens these days, it might be good to know how we look and sound from another person's laptop screen, as well as in person. You can also turn to someone you trust and respect to ask them to watch and listen to you present and give you constructive feedback. When we critique ourselves, I'm saying we critique ourselves, and that's not simply. So we say, oh, oh you did that wrong, you blew that, oh, I did this. Okay, yes, we want to identify and acknowledge what we've done that is less than stellar. And so those are opportunities. Those are areas we can improve. Once we recognize them, we can work to fix them. And when we've gone through our practice runs, what do we do? We've critiqued ourselves. We probably will edit our remarks. I do that routinely. The next step is to practice over and over again. If you're preparing for a performance review, a, a, a salary discussion, a conversation about professional development, or if you're preparing to deliver, to, or if you're thinking, you know, that, that executive of mine, she or he just might ask me for an update on such and such at the next meeting. How would I handle it if I was asked to do this? This doesn't have to be practicing a big, long speech or a presentation in front of hundreds of people as I do. It can be as simple as practicing what you might say in a certain circumstance. And so we practice, we polish, just like anything else. When we do that, we usually get better. We want to check any bad habits we have. With Dawn, it was the case of um, er, like. Uh, when you record yourself, and I do encourage you to record your voice, check, have I used any of these fillers I want to avoid? And then give yourself credit each time you practice and, you, and you've ditched a bad habit or made progress. When we do this practice, we also want to pay attention to not only our voice modulation, but how we use silence. It can be a very effective tool when we want a particular point to sink in. And lastly, when we're preparing, we want to practice making eye contact with the people to whom we're speaking. We're speaking with other people, and so we want to let them know that we are engaging with them. And we want to use open, confident body language. Again, that's a whole other training session. However, these are some guidelines. If you want to speak with some foie, this is what you can do, and I know this can help you. So, you bet, this does take work, it does take effort. Anything worthwhile does, doesn't it? I can promise you too that preparation and practice will also bring rewards. So, I promised you 20 steps, didn't I? And that was the first set of 11. What about when you're preparing to actually speak? Okay, there are a few things we want to remember, and they go back to what we've practiced. First thing we want to do 
don't focus on how we're feeling on our nerves yes you can own your nerves you can own i might be a little excited or oh, there might be some butterflies okay you know what hi you're there now settle down because i'm focusing on what these people i'm speaking with need of me what they expect of me and so when we think about other people than ourselves we're number one probably going to do a more effective job of whatever we're doing and number two that pushes any nerves any discomfort aside it says okay i acknowledge you now get out of the way i've got something to do here we want to begin when we're speaking with people or to an audience we want to establish and maintain open confident body language we want to present ourselves as someone who's worth listening to someone who knows what they're speaking about and has something worthwhile saying we want to make eye contact with our audience members we want to maintain eye contact not with the same person the whole time you might creep them out what we want to do is find different people in the crowd different people in the room and lock eyes with them briefly this lets people know we are paying attention to them we're not just rambling on about our topic we are focused on them and again that helps us maintain our focus on delivering what other people need when we're when we're presenting or how other people might be receiving this information or this persuasive case or or position or negotiation that we're attempting to deliver we want to modulate our voice if i was to speak in a monotone the whole way through without inflections and without slowing down or with speaking so slowly that you might be turning off your laptop it doesn't help people it doesn't engage people so we want to think about the pace of our voice the tone of our voice and so on again we can pause we can use silence for positive impact now i mentioned being prepared to to establish and maintain open and confident body language when we're speaking with people i can't see what you're doing right now at the other end of your screen however in person I would be watching what you're doing or if we had all everybody's faces up here i would be watching for your reactions and i would be responsive to body language i could see whether it's on screen or in person again when we make mistakes not if but when we make mistakes move forward don't dwell on them number one if we call to if we call our mistakes out if we if we trip over ourselves trying to fix something apologizing for it we're giving it more attention than it deserves and we're distracting from the positives of our presentation and there will be positives even if we make mistakes so again remember i mentioned often others aren't even aware we've made a mistake it may be the world to us and perhaps who knows one in ten people three in ten six in ten have noticed it why give more attention to a mistake than it warrants we want to fix it we want to be clear and then we move on really important when it comes to public speaking whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in front of a group we want to be vulnerable you know we have sun fraud which is coolness of mind it doesn't mean we're not human we want to be vulnerable and people will appreciate that and lastly number 20 enjoy your success you bet we make missteps we all do learn from them and celebrate what you've done well and then go back and practice for the next time because really this is all an investment in yourself whether it's personal satisfaction satisfaction professional growth achieving something you're after positioning yourself for recognition for better compensation for approval for something you're after getting that vacation time you wanted or whatever it might be these are investments in yourself so you know i've been doing this a long time I didn't know when I was 13 and 14 that what I was working on, and these, believe me, they're vocal cord exercises, so much more. We don't have to do all that. Yet I had no idea at age 13, 14, of what I was doing then would prepare me to be before you now. And yet I love it. So when you love something, when you work at it, these are some of the things that public speaking and comfort with speaking, comfort and confidence have been able to do for me. When it comes to you, whether you're here today to polish your public speaking skills, to think, are there any tips that I already know, but I might want reinforced, or whether you are someone who's really, truly 
in your comfort zone, when no one is paying a lot of attention to you, you're simply doing what you do best and you don't want to be in the spotlight. I would put it to you that when you choose to make an investment in your efforts in public speaking, and I'm talking about investments of time and energy, that's what it costs. You can impact your world. It can make impacts on, on job interviews, on being increasingly effective in those, making your voice heard during meetings, one-to-one -one conversations that might be pretty significant in terms of how things unfold in your career or your life. When you're negotiating for something, if you're advocating for yourself or for your colleagues or a cause, and think of the times when you have opportunities to step up and lead a meeting, a team, or a project. I know people who have had opportunities to do this and have not done it because they don't want to be public speaking. They're uncomfortable with it. And they're very skilled, intelligent, capable people. So what else can public speaking have potential to do for you? If you work at it, this can also impact how your performance reviews and evaluations unfold. When you go in prepared and you've practiced what you want to say and anticipate what the audience, what the person at the other end of the conversation or the other people might have to say about your performance or professional development goals and so on. What about presentations? I know a lot of assistants who have so much talent to share and have come up to me at the end of conferences and say, I want to do what you do. And I say, great. And then it's time to start work and preparing and practicing. And you can do this when you're working full time. I presented at conferences for years before I began doing this professionally as my career. And one of the important things is that we can build confidence. And it shows when we are more comfortable, more skilled, because we have worked at it, at public speaking, it shows. We get personal satisfaction. And it's a victory. If you're one of the people who's just not comfortable with public speaking. Any progress we make is a victory that we should celebrate and, and it adds to our confidence going forward. All of this can also have reputational impacts on us, which impacts our career. So think please, think. What else is in it for you when it comes to public speaking and polishing those skills, working at them? And think, why not? Now, I have some articles on my website. I've put a QR code up there for you. You might want to take your smartphone, point your camera at the QR code, and that will uh, bring up a white pop-up screen that you can tap and, and dig into later and, and see some articles I've written about public speaking. You can also just go to my website, exceptionalea.com, and just enter in the search field, public speaking. So, I've tossed some ideas your way today. You may not have a pet or you may not want to subject your puppy dog or your cat or goldfish or bird to, to your practice runs. There's no harm in doing it if you try it. You may think it's kind of silly to <laughs> practice in front of a mirror. I tell you, that's one of the best ways you will see what you're doing well, what you could improve upon and so on. And really, if we're not comfortable speaking to ourselves, how can we be comfortable speaking in front of a group of people? Tap in, please. Tap into people you trust, respect, and whose judgment you admire. And all of these things, all of these things can help you feel more comfortable, more polished, and more effective when it comes to public speaking. Really, this is a skill. You may be into sports. You know that you have to practice to improve. You may be a talented or gifted musician or you, whatever your skills are. I love photography. The more we work intentionally at something, the more skilled we become and the more confident we become. So take those steps, figure out what's in it for me. Why do I want to improve my public speaking? Or why do I want to tweak or polish my public speaking skills? And with that, I will drop the mic. I will say thank you very much for being with me today. I hope you found this useful. If you know other assistants or other people who could benefit from, from thinking about public speaking a little differently than they have or looking for ideas, please refer them to this ASAP vlog. And I would love it if you want to take a minute in the comments section. If you found anything in here useful, please give it a thumbs up. And what about your public speaking. Did you think, did you find anything here today that it will be useful to you, that you'll practice? Drop comments in the in the messages below. I'll watch for them and I'll certainly respond. I'm Sheila Donnelly of Exceptional EA. 
really glad to have spent this time with you and i wish you all the best with your public speaking.